Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in African American Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Nikazi Oates, the host of the channel. Today, we're talking to Professor Deborah Willis. She's a celebrated photographer, acclaimed historian of photography, a MacArthur and a Guggenheim Fellow, and university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. She also is the director of NYU's Center for Black Visual Culture. And we'll be talking about her new book, The Black Civil War Soldier, A Visual History, A Conflict, and Citizenship. Professor Willis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to share my work with you and your audience. Great. I'm so excited for our conversation. So I want to begin with you telling a bit about yourself. So I recognize that you come to photography in several different ways or several different positions. You are a Black woman, you're a mother, you're a daughter. And you're also a curator and a historian of photography. And so I wondered, what's your relationship to photography? And I wonder if those particular positions influence how you see photography. They all do, but I'm also a photographer. Mm -hmm. So that's Mm -hmm. um, the the main um, point for me in terms of my identity in all of the five ways of describing me in terms of how I came to photography. I grew up with a family who loved the image, loved posing, loved sharing stories. They were all storytellers. Um, My father's side of the family um, also loved image image making. And my father's cousin had a photographic studio. We grew up in uh, North Philadelphia. And my mother's side of the family uh, loved to perform in front of the camera. <laughs> and, you know, so they loved to pose. They were singers and dancers and, and loved life. And so I grew up uh, looking at images um, of family members that were preserved um, through family images and family uh, snapshots and the photographic album. My father, uh, my my father was also a policeman in Philadelphia in the 1950s, 60s, throughout the 70s um, and 80s, and so he was a policeman for a long time. Image was a, was central to him after World War II, and my and he photographed a lot when he was in the army with um, another army buddy um, who who lived uh, maybe about two blocks away, who was the North Philadelphia photographer for the black press, uh, Jack Franklin. So my father also had images when he traveled to Paris and to Germany and his experiences. But he also had a, prior to that experience, he, he after the war, he went to a school that was uh, it's called Berean Institute. And after that experience, he decided to open up a tailor shop. My mom um, had a beauty shop and the two of them also own a grocery store. So they were always um, representing the community in different ways. And so growing up in that very busy, um, always working <laughs> household, I was always looking at images and from style of dress uh, because my mother didn't sew. My father hemmed our clothes. And, you know, so just imagining that experience with, you know, a cop who is, you know, hemming and but sewing buttons on things like that. So I grew up just kind of watching and observing. I was a, a middle child and, um, and I always tease everyone that um, as the middle one, you're always observing. 
<laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. I wonder with all of your, you know, remarkable experiences with photography and image making, I wonder, do you have a particular philosophy of photography? And if so, what is it? I don't know if it's a philosophy, but it's something that I've always felt that, um, that photography had was about representation and representing, representing a moment, but it also was a way of um, visual communication through advertising, um, through family images, but also represented what the world imagined or could see within um, identities, specifically black identities. I was interested in the power of image making when I decided to go to art school. And so my philosophy, when, I, when I'm teaching a class on the black body and the lens, I'm always exploring how representation has been um, explored through uh, and imagined and just realized um, and un unfortunately accepted or rejected in, in many ways. So these are points that I'm constantly thinking about, looking at ways to think about um, desire and what how cultures are, are viewed in, in, in different forms of the photographic moment. Mm -hmm. To that point, when you mentioned that you recognize the power of image making when you attended art school, I think about um, any career that one has. Um, I don't think we talk publicly or enough about the different moments that we have, um, whether it's insecurity or self-doubt, um, but then also on the flip side, like really great, like triumphs and achievements. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered if you could give an example, whether it was in art school or beyond, when you had a moment of self-doubt, but then pair that with moments of reassurance that this is what you are supposed to do and the topic that you um, are interested in and want to interrogate is one that is necessary, if not essential. Mm -hmm. There's a, it's a great, wonderful uh, point to consider because there's this um, phrase that I use sometimes and it's, I don't see it as self-doubt, but I see it as the little girl from North Philadelphia with bangs see you know standing on a podium representing and you know questioning how did you get here you know and and um so i i don't know if it's self-doubt it's 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 about discovery in a, in a funny way um i have a friend who um teaches in um in psychology in in, in dc and i said i said to him i said you know sometimes I um, think about that little girl from North Philly with the bangs. And he says, you know, sometimes you need to leave her at home, you know, when, <laughs> you, when you want to move forward on something because she is always asking you, how did you get up here? And so, um, so I never thought about it as self-doubt, but it's always a sense of wonderment. And, um, but I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if I reject the idea of self-doubt, but I always think about her. And then and then she just kind of like soothes me, you know, um, through the moment. And sometimes those moments are, um, you know, through sitting in a classroom of 18 men, um, white men, and one from the UAE, and having three women in the class, two black, one white, and a teacher <laughs> points out to me that um, I, uh, you know, I'm asking the question, where are the black photographers in, in, in our books and our representation when we talk about images and basically saying that they didn't exist. And having the the wherewithal to push forward to say, raise my hand to say, wait a minute, there's something missing in this curriculum. 
there's something missing in the syllabus. Where are they? Because I grew up in a beauty shop that had ebony, jet, tan, <laughs> sepia, every you know range of the black spectrum magazine and look in life and knew that there were black photographers out there. So that sense of um, questioning was a part of that little girl standing up to say, okay, it's, you know, you, you, you have to ask this question. And, and so that's where I, I, that, that sense of moment that you're, that moment of you say of self-doubt or triumph, it kind of, it kind of flips um, and twists both sides at, of the same coin. And that happened when, when I was in, in, um, in school, I knew that, my my dad, when I was in high school, um, no one understood that I was interested in the arts. You know, my father wanted me to work, get, you know, of course, a great city job, um, work for a woman who I've never met, but her name was Goldie Watson. And I, I knew she had blonde hair. She was a black woman with blonde hair in the 19, you know, 70s, 60s, late 60s and 70s. Um, and and they they had hoped that I would you know go to business school. I went to a junior college, Pierce Junior College, and was um, ready to take on that. But across the street was the art school that I wanted to attend, which was the Philadelphia College of Art. Every day I walked past for two years that art school and was determined to put together a portfolio and apply for that school because that's where I, I had my, my desire to, to be there. And that's something that I focused on while I was in school. And I took advantage of the idea of, of um, working as a secretary, an assistant. Um, and I worked for a center for uh, community studies at Temple University, a woman by the name of Linda Clark, who organized um, uh, training programs for VISTA volunteers in, in West Virginia or in, in the holler in different places in Kentucky. Work with, you know, fantastic black men who were community organizers and traveled with them on these little small planes to, <laughs> to places in West Virginia as we began to develop ways for um, people who lived in the holler, both black and white, um, to prepare them for for work life, um, which could be either community organizing, working in offices and things like that. So that experience that I, I gained from the junior college business school experience, um, I still learn today. I mean, I had that experience. Um, I still use those tools um, and that sense of critical thinking through the experience of community organizing through my work, which is amazing. I never talked about that. <laughs> you know, mm. <laughs> I never really talked about that question. And it all gives that you that question you just brought up about the moment of self-doubt and and moment of triumph. That's um but working with a, a woman who was um, in charge and understood what it meant to um, make a difference in different in different areas and and it opened up doors for me because I knew then I wanted to make images I made images there it was a harrowing experience because I was dealing with a lot of racism um, of of being in, in in Huntington West Virginia in 1968 um, at 67 and just imagining um, how people were, we were stoned um, telling us to get out the holler. Um, but we were also, I was given bedding that had bed bugs by the people. And I couldn't, didn't understand why I had bumps all over my body and, but could see the point and went to the doctors. And that's what it was um, because people didn't want us there. And they were, you know, we were tricked into thinking that <laughs> that we were we were um, there for a reason, but um, but it was also a, a lesson for me, and I and I pushed forward and continued my work. Um, 
I eventually left the center after uh, two years and decided to uh, move to New York and study photography officially at a photography school here um, in New York. While I was in school, I also worked for Neighborhood Youth Corps in, in Ocean Hill, Brownsville in New York and taught photography to the kids in the community there as well as taught photography at Fashion High School, Institute High School in, um, in Manhattan. And I spent you know, a year um, making images, teaching images, met some fantastic students People in the community, they were really excited about, you know, us being there and uh, young people there, you know, creating a, a space for, for art in, in that community. I think about the early experience when you questioned, um, you know, the curiosity, the, right, the rightful curiosity about where are the Black photographers. Um, you're, you're asking that question in a room full of white men who don't necessarily understand, you know, your question. But I wonder, um, is that, was that like the nascent um, beginning of how you would understand your career to question, to figure out what, who was missing, we're missing um, uh, a segment of the population? Or was that also the beginning of, you know, one of your classic works, the Reflections in Black, the the history of black photographers. Would you link it back to that moment in that classroom? I'd link it back to that moment in the classroom. I link, I, I continue to, and, and had a pushback um, from that, but I had um, two women professors, white women professors who um, one, I asked if I could just do an independent study um, with her to create a uh, work and look and identify black photographers' names. Um, and I did, and I, it was accepted. The two professors I worked with were central in, in guiding me through um, the semester. I had no idea that that would be um, my life's work because um, one of the, the same professor who would show work of black people that of course, you know, stoop labor we experience, but we also experience, you know, other parts of our ex performances and jobs in, in, in imagery. And I wanted to um, ask also to include images that not only represented, but celebrated black life in different ways. And I, but he's the one who said to me that, um, why am I there? Because why was I there? Because all I was going to do is get pregnant and have a baby and a good man could have been in this classroom. A good, you know, So I was taking up a good man's seat. And I recall that moment of, you know, total, um, you know, the heat <laughs> around my neck. I can imagine uh, what I probably look like, but just the feel the sense of that his entitlement to say that I was, I could, he was denying my sense of being a woman, my, my bodily experience of being a woman um, that put to shame me to also have a desire. If I wanted to have children at a young age, then that it was, it was either have a, get a job or be a photographer or, or not have children. So basically um, he was shaming me as a woman in a public space of, of men who all just turned around and looked at me like, yeah, you know, it could have been 19 men in this classroom <laughs> as opposed to 18 <laughs> and, and you took up his space. And, um, and I remember, um, <laughs> and I was, I mean, the power that he had over me at that point where I was silenced and, and when I graduated, exactly what happened, um, you know, I got pregnant um, that year. Um, and, and then it, it, in terms of the sense of self-doubt, that, that is something that um, 
that's the power that people could have, one could have over uh, someone who could just deny them their sense of space and and just the, the sense of character of, of purpose when I wanted to um, become a photographer. So, of course, I didn't want to go to Philadelphia. You know, I was pregnant. I'm like, wait a minute. What's, after three months, I said, what, what am I doing? How can I let this man stop me from visiting family, being seen pregnant? And so I, I was back and forth with, I had to laugh and, and throw it off and, and, and make photographs of my pregnant belly and use that. I've met, since then, I've met women and I've made photographs, I, I exhibited the photographs and I've met women who told me the same story. Uh, I've met husbands who shared with me, I wish my wife was here to listen to you talk about that photograph specifically because my wife, same thing happened to her, um, that male professors and sometimes women professors said the exact same thing um, that, you know, you have to make a choice. I met a woman who two years ago, never forget, she was 80 years old. And she said she was told the same thing. And she didn't go back to making art. She didn't make art again until she was in her late 60s. And that, and, and you know, just the fact that this could happen to so many people, women from all walks of life in terms of opportunities that they could have had um, as, as artists. So um, that happened <laughs> and connecting that, I went to grad school, exa exact same experience um, at Pratt, which was another place I, I always wanted to go to for grad school. Um, and once I graduated from Pratt, well, back to just um, back up for a second, I after, when I was when I started the research of going into the stacks and libraries at Temple and in Philadelphia and at at, um, at my own um, the local libraries in Philly, I found black photographers through city directories and looking at the black press where they advertise. I saw images. And I collected a name of names of about 300 names just by sitting on the floor in the stacks and having an opportunity to, I, you know, I was not a traditional researcher, so I just didn't know how they, you know, the used card catalog. So I just, just turned the pages. And, and, and as a result, I found unusual names. I found names and I had, I went to the Schomburg Center. Uh, in 1974, I wrote to Gordon Parks and Monita Sleet and the photographers who were um, Morgan and Marvin Smith, who were still, they were in their 70s and 80s. I wrote to them. Um, Gordon Parks, the first one responded and said, you know, Debbie, please come and visit me. <laughs> wow. Know? I'll never forget going to his apartment <laughs> at Human Plaza. Gordon Parks, who world-renowned yes. <laughs> renowned photographer, <laughs> Travel the world, and he's calling me Debbie. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and, and having that opportunity, it um, in the seventies, and going to the Schomburg and meeting the librarians there, who said that they helped me find the photographs, but the photographs weren't identified by photographers, so I had to go through numbers of photographs. And and the last year I was at Pratt. I had the never walk down a corridor, this corridor on the the West Campus ever, but something guided me to that corridor, which had a post up there for a position as a photographic specialist at the New York Public Library, John Burke Center, and I put that's my job. So I applied for it, applied for two jobs, one for teaching at Bucks County Community College, which was idyllic. Um, even if I wanted to be a photographer and it was $11,000 and the, the um, job at Schomburg was 10, eight. <laughs> and I um, applied for both, got both of them, you know, offered the job for both of them. And then I of course took the Schomburg 
physician and a, and a man by the name of Richard Newman, who worked for Garland Publishing at the time, I call him um, my publishing angel. He he called me up, didn't know me, and said, how would you like to do a book on black photographers? So I, I said, uh, oh, I said, I have an undergraduate paper, undergraduate language <laughs> in on this topic. I can't believe you're calling me. And he said, send it to me. Um, you know, we didn't have computers then. We had, you know, onion skin, carbon copy paper. <laughs> and, um, I sent it to him and he read it and said, this is a book. He, we, we're going to publish this. And um, that had 300 names. And I found all of the photographs that I could find at the Library of Congress, um, Schomburg and National Archives. I and of course, Marlon Spingarn at um, at Howard University. So I, you know, was new to research. I'm, you know, a, a new mother graduating, and all of those things happen. And that began the research for Black photographers, 1840 to 1940, which is the basics, basic, um, the core for Reflections in Black: A History of Black Photographers. Wow. That is incredible. Incredible. And I just think about what if, um, you know, you did not ask the question, right? If I wonder if you did not have the encouragement from professors, or at least the one professor who said, you know, I think there's some value in that. Um, but then also, you have these professional experiences, um, one encounter research, um, the way that you've found it, right? It may not have been traditional or the conventional ways of doing research, but you found 300 names. Um, mm -hmm. And then you, um, you know, landed at the Schomburg and then you came across the, the publisher. So all of those, I mean, just fantastic moments that led up to this seminal work, just remarkable. I also wonder uh, when you talk about the encounters of your um, race and womanness, right, and how um, that was coupled with misogyny throughout your, all of your experiences, um, and how many women supported and say, I went through the same thing. I think about another seminal work of yours, which is Pose and Beauty, um, but thinking about it aesthetically. Um, you know, it's more than a decade um, old at this point, um, but it's a classic work of yours in which you visualized a history of African-American beauty. Um, in it, you provide a framework that I think is just so great. Um, and it composed of three um, elements, uh, constructing the pose, which makes me think about, you know, family, when you mm -hmm. spoke about um, how um, they love the image and love posing. Um, the second one is the body and the image. And then the last one is modeling beauty and um, beauty contest. How did you come up with that conceptualization? Mm. You know, um, let's see, I met, I was in Schomburg in the 80s. In the late 80s, I met a, a young woman um, photographer by the name of Carla Williams through her professor who called me up, who, who was a white male professor who called me up and said, I have a black woman who's photographing her bottom and I don't know how to critique it. I don't know what to say about it. And I would like for you to, to meet her. And can you, can you just kind of give me some guidance or can you talk to her? And so I met Carla and, you know, we talked on the phone and we laughed about her professor reaching out to me um, because he didn't do it for um, the white women who were doing self-portraits. He did it for to the black women who were doing self-portraits. And, and so we talked about body and image a lot. And we decided to do a book together called The Black Female Body in Photography, um, 1840 um, to, to then the present with Temple University Press. And we were looking at images from Africa, from the Caribbean, from the States, but then 
looking at the the noble images of of women, the images that were seen of black women in the world's fairs where they were dressed to exoticize or to um, have images that represented um, some expressive imagination of a tourist photographer. And um, the book was just an amazing project and sold out in, in no time and and we didn't reprint it. And I was going through, um, decided later um, when I left the Schomburg to go, I was offered the position at the then, it was called the National African American Museum Project. It was to explore the possibility if there, if there was a nation call or a national call for collections to create an African American museum. Um, I worked with Claudine Brown, and the two of us traveled um, throughout the states and places in Europe and and Africa um, to identify collections. And through that experience, I found images that were just beautiful images of Black people that were in their family collections, images that when we talk about Black people in the 19th century, beauty is not a word that's part of the description. You know, we, we, we always, you know, yes, resilience, you know, hardworking, laborer, but beauty was never in the description within even within African American writings, but with female and femi- and women writers, we could find that construction. Um, and then the unfortunate aspect of it, you know, I had got cancer, um, had breast cancer, and I um, was, you know, pretty down and didn't know if I had a future, and. And I watched people respond to me with a bald head. And even in the hospital with other cancer patients, people just kind of looked at me and said, can she just move to the other side of the room and not be in our part where we're getting our chemo treatment? And so the nurses always acquiesced and would say, would you mind moving into this room here? And because you don't have a scarf on or hat on, blah, blah, blah. And so it, it surprised me. And I thought even in death, facing death, beauty is something that was that needed to be discussed and talked about. And so I connected my work, my research from um, all of the work from Reflections in Black, from going to family collections and to my experience with cancer to think about how do we talk about beauty? And you know, I grew up with um, modeling schools in North Philadelphia and debutantes. You know, my sister was you know a debutante at sixteen, and and beauty. You know, so my mother was there doing hair for all of these young girls and and the experience of that, and and so I wanted to um, do a book about beauty and look at that question and thinking about what Toni Morrison says is that beauty is, is, just is, you know, you know, why do we question it? And so I wanted to explore that thought about Ida B. Wells, where people looked at her, said that, you know, that she's beautiful, but she needs to stop working as an activist, you know? So, you know, you had choices to make with, if you were beautiful, don't use these um, um, frameworks to um, fight about, fight against, um, and fight for freedom or um, lynching um, bills and things like that. So all of that was part of how do we think about beauty is political, um, and that's where it all kind of came together in in this swirl of cancer. Uh, the experience of family photographs. But then when we think about the black arts movement of, of that time period, I knew everyone I knew had that poster of, of, of um, Susan Taylor 
with her hoop earrings and her bald head on their walls. And it was just one of the highlights of, of notions of black beauty. And I contacted the photographer who was living in Jamaica but had no idea that he was, um, his life was in peril, that he was dying. And he allowed me to, um, use the photograph and, you know, gave me a price and, and, and allowed me to use the photograph. And so that's why, um, that image is on the cover and then using Eve Arnold's image of Malcolm X on the back cover was another central way of looking at male beauty, because I wanted to also consider how do we think about fashion um, the clove body, the constructed images of, of black men, um, because they look beautiful, <laughs> you know, and, and, and Malcolm always um, was um, not only represented the, the image of beauty, but also the image of masculinity, black masculinity at that time period. And Sue's and um, the photographer, um, and having the, the photographs, rather, of Susan and Malcolm as iconic figures on, on the cover of Posing Beauty was, was, to me, was really important. Absolutely. So just not only the content is outstanding, but as you remark, the, the um, cover and the back image are just as iconic as the, um, the actual book that you produced so it's fantastic and i really am appreciative of you telling us um, how that came to be i want to um, segue into um, the black civil war and kind of put this in the context of the noted works that you have um, discussed so aesthetically um, the black civil war soldier um, is kind of different than some of the classic works that um, you have produced, like Pose and Beauty and um, um, Reflections in Black, as well as um, Black, A Celebration of a Culture, which all three I possess. Um, The the Black uh, Civil War soldier um, is slender than the books that I just mentioned. Um, But then also the content, the composition, is paired um, with photography uh, photos as well as um, a sustained narrative um, as well as snippets of um, letters which we will get to in a second so talk to me about this um, the aesthetics but more importantly tell me about the black civil war soldier and how you came to this topic and project um this is uh, a book the black civil war soldier uh, the photographs. It also started working at the Schomburg Center, looking mm-hmm. at images of Black Civil War soldiers that I never heard about when I was in school. Mm-hmm. Didn't know that there there were photographs of Black Civil War soldiers. We knew World War One Black soldiers. Uh, we knew. I knew personally because my great grandfather was in the um, Spanish American War. And he, when we were kids, he would talk about, well, back in 98, you know, he was like, 98? (laughs) That was about 98. He was just, he was a fascinating man. But having um, that experience that I never knew that there were images that represented um, black soldiers in the civil, in the civil war, we knew that, quote, Lincoln freed the um, black people but we never knew the story of black people freeing themselves or that experience. And I worked at the Schomburg Center. And then when I moved to the Smithsonian looking for collections, I met a number of white collectors who had a treasure trove of photographs, of images of, you know, men who were posed in front of backdrops with American flags, um, with landscape. So I began to think about how do we imagine, how did, how did it happen that these photographs were, did not circulate? And then I found some family members, black family members who had photographs, 
but it was didn't not the numbers that that we see today, which um, I really wanted to purchase when I was at the Smithsonian, but could not, and um, because the price like two and three million dollars at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily, the the collectors. Um, were able to get support from Yale, purchased some photographs, the Library of Congress purchased some as well. And so they are now in public collections, but at that time they were not. But my father was, an, I mean, he loved history. And we used to go to Gettysburg. Um, he was from Virginia, so we knew um, Fredericksburg. We, You know, he lived in that area of Orange County, so we... I knew Civil War history through my father's interest in um, travel. And he was an avid traveler and and a tourist. And we visited a lot of places, a lot of sites. We have photographs from, you know, only from the Valley Forge years of, of the American Revolution to. And so it was just fascinating for me to see these images uh, that weren't that didn't circulate. Once I had an opportunity to um, think about these images and um, I wrote an essay that was, unfortunately, was denied the publication because um, one of the editors disagreed with my account of the description of, of this experience. So one of the things that I was, and they said, well, if you change this part of the essay, We'll publish it, and I, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. And you know, I gave a, a fantastic talk about it. People were interested in it, but um, this editor didn't want, didn't he disagreed with my um, the as I talked about the war and the experience of these soldiers. But I'm reading the, and I found the information that I discovered in. Um, the oral history of slave narratives from the WPA period. Hmm. I found black newspapers uh, and abolitionist newspapers where they were um, soldiers wrote letters and published them and sent them to as if they're diary accounts of their experiences in South Carolina and sending it to paper, newspapers in Boston and Connecticut and New York about their experience in the war. Hmm. So I, it wasn't, it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, the, the, the person decided, nope, we're not publishing it. And, and the institution went along with the editor. And, and, and so of course I was, that was disappointing for me. But, um, you know, it's happened before with, when I wrote about James Van Der Zee and mm-hmm. um, a, a director said I was over, I was inflating, over inflating James Van Der Zee's contribution to um, the history of photography, and I can't, com- I couldn't. How dare I compare him to some of the early um, photographers of the pictorialist period? So <laughs> I've saved all of those um, comments. Um, that one day I will say that it's disheartening, um, mm-hmm. you know, that that people who control the publishing experience will will decide that, nope, we're not going to publish this. Hmm. I um, gave a talk. I was invited to give a talk at the British, Irish, British, <laughs> British, Irish, American Studies Association in Belfast. in I think about five years ago. And the person who invited me was Celeste Bernier Fournier, who also worked on the book on Frederick Douglass and the photographs of Frederick Douglass. And I presented the paper there and told um, the people that I was really happy, (laughs) the audience there, that I was really happy to be there and to share my research. And this was an opportunity to explore this story of letter writing because black people, we were told that black people couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. Here were evidence of letter writing, um, even if they were scribe, um, written by a scribe, there were people who were available to tell their story. So they asked if I was in, if I would be interested in publishing my paper in the journal, and so that happened. And 
And then my colleagues here at NYU Press asked if I would also publish the book, and that's how the book um, um, was published. And it took, you know, it took basically five years from from the beginning of the research, which also explored ways to think about, you know, a collective memory, um, a memory from family, but also the experience of how um, you know the monuments um, are mm. are central in the discussion of monuments are central to our um, our framing because I believe and I it might be naive but that if if people could actually see these images that black people could experience um, that white and black all Americans um, could see that these soldiers were there and mm. fighting for uh, freedom in front of American flags. They believed in their citizenship, mm. even though many of them were enslaved at that time. Mm. But also that they, you know, used the U S brass button. Um, they wore it on their, their belts and on their lapels. They, you know, had hand painted, hand tinted American flags so America was part of their framing, even though they worked in collaboration with the photographer, but there was, there was a sense of agency in, in the making and, and the creation of these uh, photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you said that when you were at the Schomburg um, and you came across during the research of this, of this book, you came across just a, a wealth of, um, photographs of um, black civil war soldiers um you note in the book that this is a a moment um and um newsmakers photographers um really are trying to capture and document this and and in a way i would imagine if it was you know the 21st century it would kind of be like a, a um a documentary in a sense um mm -hmm. because you wrote Quote, um, and, and you're quoting a journalist here, the Civil War marked the first time the large numbers of reporters, artists, and photographers followed troops into battle. And then someone else wrote, photographers captured the experience of war on the battlefields, at campsites, and in temporary studios where soldiers struck poses before the camera, eager to preserve their memories of the war. And with that, I just have a new framing of what you said that African American soldiers understand this moment and they want to narrate how they will be remembered um, in history, but then also to their families. Because another part that you mentioned, I think, in the, the, the thesis of this project is that um, you are trying to. Um, get people to understand that black soldiers fought for and they died for their freedom, but also for their families. And I think you actually mentioned that early on. And that reframing um, helps me to think about, um, think about um, soldiers in a particular way, in a different way than the way historians and other scholars, as well as artists, have said, um, have said it. I don't know if you have something to um, to add on. Yeah, I, you know, I um, I love um, reading, you know, history, and but I also think that history also has a had a place for setting art and setting photography, mm -hmm. and through that text, I I felt it was important to. A number of historians, I mean, they, they're documents and they're, you know, there's not, there's, you don't have a sense to engage with the, the, the sense of memory, um, the personal memory. And I wanted not only the, I wanted to, I guess, experience the, the voices of, of women hmm. um, that we rarely had an opportunity to read about when we we always knew of the white lieutenants and captains and how they guided these uh, black soldiers to battlefields and you know from you know crater to 
Fort Wagner. But they're, they're the stories that this always told in that one week class that we have of, of the Civil War when I was in school. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a semester of Civil War. We didn't have long histories of it. So that was that was the same narrative that I that it that I experienced in reading the the way that public education and even when I attended college, Civil War was not necessarily a part of the language or the history rather when studying it. So when I decided to um, find ways to incorporate um, new voices or new narratives. I felt it was important to use the journalists, the letters of mothers and women, and also the soldiers themselves, who were pretty funny in terms of hilarious when, and the way that they wrote about that talking back to the master, you know, I'm, I'm coming back for my wife and children. So you mm-hmm. treat them well because I'm coming back. Mm-hmm. So they they were they were pretty brave in in their language and unfortunately because of um the black soldiers left the plantations or the the land and left the women and children on the land. Many of the women were brutalized, children were raped and and mistreated um and killed. Because um, black soldiers uh, left the um, left the plantation, but what they also left was that their determination that they're going to come back, they're going to return, and they're going to fight. But there was this sense of evidence that never really highlighted for me um, that black people had the sense of bravery. Hmm. You know, um, there was always this this hesitation of pushing the, the sense of bravery and writing about uh, bravery in um, the um, 19th century. Hmm. And also black love hmm. was never um, talked about <laughs> for me in, in reading 19th century stories of, of uh, you know, horrific experiences but when when the men and women exchanged letters or when the men wrote back to their masters or their mistresses they would say um you know i'm coming back and that's that's an expression mm. of love mm. um that their commitment to their families having the opportunity to have their photographs made with their family members also was a sense of uh, we've in a new way of realizing um, the importance of family in 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 portrait making of of black soldiers. Mm. So all of that was um, amazed me, <laughs> um, opened up new new narratives for me, and gave me an opportunity to um, to rethink um, this story. But also, I, I was in Pittsburgh um, some years ago given a talk and there was a hist- a postdoc uh, historian there and he mentioned to me about the um, using the pension records in the National Archives mm. which I never mm. used never thought about using never <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know like, why would I go to the pension records you know and I thought about oh yeah I can look at my great great grandfather but then I he, he introduced me to the Brewsters, where a woman who fought for her um, father's, um, her, I mean, her husband's pension um, for a number of years and denied each time she pr- to prove that he was a soldier. She sent his photograph. She described where he was injured and described his injuries and where he lived all of that, but um, denied his pension. Mm-hmm. And and at the same time, I was reading, uh, it was the 75th anniversary of Gone with the Wind. And, you know, I grew up looking at Gone with the Wind with my family, you know, crying and all that stuff, but not really <laughs> knowing what the story was about mm-hmm. and not realizing, well, wait a minute, let me just look at this. So I decided to, while researching this book, is to 
look and teach the class Gone with the Wind. And I was invited to the mm. 75th anniversary of, Gone, of the Gone with the Wind um, conference at UT Austin and um, gave a talk. I looked at the images, but it was fascinating for me and reading Hattie McDaniel's um, biography where her father also um, fought in the Civil War Hmm. and she also fought for his pension for 13 years and Hmm. never received it. Photograph of him, where he was injured in in Tennessee, his experience similar to the Brewsters, but denied the pension. Hmm. And, And then her experience of feeling that she needed to have that, you know, that role because it was central to her her own personal history, but the um, the making of the Going with the Wind, I noticed quilts that were made um, by Black people that Hattie McDaniels also, in terms of wearing earrings and, and lipstick and, you know, different ways of reading Hattie's role um, really helped me... Um, Guide, you know, guided me through this book as well. Was mm-hmm. how do we see women not as the the person who helped Scarlett, you know, Hara, but the person who really maintained the land, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, reminding me of the you know the musicians in the film. When if you ever have to teach it, <laughs> just look at the black musicians who are playing the classical music at the waltz, uh, mm-hmm. the waltz, mm-hmm. which. Never noticed them before, and until I, um, until I, you know, worked on this book, but also just the, those classic moments of, of how do we how do we read that that experience, and so it was important for me to think about black male identity through um, portrait making, but through writing, mm-hmm. and and think about women and mothers, you know, feisty mothers writing to Abraham Lincoln, but then the discovery of black surgeons mm-hmm. how would mm-hmm. i know that there are black surgeons i did not know until um a researcher um a curator at the nih um jill newmark had an exhibition of that included the the civil war in medicine and that was another experience for me as well mm-hmm. yeah it's in the in you in your book you mentioned that you employed um a new method um where you coupled un- unidentified soldiers posing in uniforms with freed bonds women um or um bond women dressed fashionably um and while they're dressed in their their work garments so I just think that that's just a wonderful practice. And do you see this as a practice of of Black love? Or how are you thinking about this particular methodology, the way that I read it? Mm -hmm. I I see it, you know, also recognizing um, the craft of of, of Black women in dress, that we are now seeing the dress body. Um, we've always seen the tattered clothes of black women, but we also think about cotton as the commodity in, um, South Carolina during that time and how, um, it was distributed to Europe and other places, but seeing that these women who some were making the clothes, some were knitting, um, um, the socks, but to to know that they were all working in collaboration to represent a visual sense, even they understood photography as well. Mm. And it's not like photography was foreign to them because I'm I'm sure that they were photogra- They saw photographs in in the homes that they uh, worked in, lived in. But the photographers also there were there were days that white photographers opened up doors for black. Uh, citizens free and bond to um, to be photographed. So when I'm thinking about citizens, I'm thinking about the residents of the uh, of the city. Mm-hmm. The white photographers who in one white photographer in Mississippi described that he was chased out of town because he 
opened up the studio to blacks at the, the hour before whites could enter. So understanding the importance of, of what photographs meant um, was was not um, a foreign experience for people who were enslaved, who were opposed, because we know of the Agassiz images of the um, and the J.T. Zealy images of the black people who were um, seen as objects. And this is an opportunity with this book. I wanted to explore the dress body. Mm -hmm. You also wrote um, here that um, in addition to public demand for images of battlefields and newsmakers, photographers profited from the immense market for individual portraits of servicemen. The great demand for portraits was a natural consequence of the departure of hundreds of thousands of young men for the uncertainties of war. Soldiers routinely exchanged portraits with their loved ones before they left for war and then transmitted later images by mail. With the death and unignorable reality, many soldiers sat repeatedly for portraits in order to ensure the longevity of at least their image and their memory. And then I think about, as you talk about the dress body, I think about the work that the uniform is doing for soldiers. So I wonder, um, and, and not just for the viewer and not just for you as the researcher, but um, other people, African-Americans and presumably white people um, were struck by the uniforms. So could you talk about the uniforms as part of the performance of black ma uh, manhood, uh, black masculinity, or even the politics of black male bravery? Mm -hmm. When, um, as, as you were describing it, I was just thinking about what, um, what it meant for them mm. um, that but the the other unfortunate aspect of they were of course underpaid. Mm -hmm. um, there, they received um, thirteen dollars, and you know, but then three three dollars of that was paid for uh, paid for the uniform. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that aspect of of the difficult of understanding that experience was was hard for me to just imagine that. You know, the government is asking them to to um, be a part of the war, but also underpaying. And then there were soldiers who decided they would not take the pay, the lower pay. Hmm. Um, but having the opportunity to wear the uniform um, had a, a tremendous effect on the soldiers. And many of them wrote about what it meant to have the... Um, uniform, the, the hat, the belt, and it really had a sense of manhood and bravery within the framing. And then there were the, the different styles that were created um, during that time period that were, um, were central to men in the South who were part of the, the um, I'm trying to remember the, the, the title, but it'll come in a second. <laughs> but the the way that they posed, you, you, you could feel um, their their the importance of, of dress for them mm -hmm. and and what it meant for them, what it communicated to them in in wearing the uniform and um, why can't I think of that name? But it'll come in a second. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was also wondering, um, you as a researcher and presenting um, this visual history, um, I was talking about this particular book to one of my friends um, who is a PhD student um, as well. And um, he's also an, uh, a photographer. And he said something that begin to make me think about, you know, our role, particularly um, for you as you craft this, this book. Um, and his name is Dustin Gavin. And he basically said um, something to the effect of, 
um, the book as um, like an exhibition or a curatorial space um, and that you present documents um, and leave for the reader to make their own interpretation. I wonder, as a researcher, as a photographer, as a curator, did you see that um, um, and did you adopt that practice in constructing this this narrative and this book as a this book as a curatorial space? No, but I love the idea. Um, I want to thank him for that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I love the idea. What I had hoped that um, the reader um, would experience is the a sense of discovery, mm. um, looking at the images that the the dress, but also the portraits. These um, individuals are looking beyond the camera lens in some, time, in some spaces where I think that they're sending a message to that there, that there, there, there is and will be a black future. Hmm. And, and that's what I, every time I looked at the images and, and there were so many images I wanted to include, um, that I couldn't because I had a limited number of images and, 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 and no, um, outside grant. I could not get a grant for this book. So when I think about the, when black men wore the uniform, it angered, um, the, 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 the slaveholders in the South, but it also angered, um, men in Baltimore who, who actually pulled one of the soldiers off the, um, one of the surgeons off the trolley and beat him because he was wearing uh, the blue, the, the uniform. Hmm. So it angered, you know, mobs and angered others um, and angered individual men because they understood the power of the uniform. Hmm. Hmm. They understood that. But then when we, as, as, as your colleague suggests that, how do we um, curate this as, as a, as a framing of looking at, you know, black family, black masculinity, uh, black fashion, and it's it's all part of that that sense of um, it's all here, hmm. and and I think that having what I was what I had hoped to do that the reader would see and and realize that there is a history that they've been denied hmm. about um, about black people, hmm. you know the. Fleetwood's diary is another, you know, the handwritten diary mm. where he was talking about food and what what it felt to be cold or wet, um, but moving forward, um, the sensitivity that 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 he described in in the um, in his diary, and and that these diaries were sold um, to both black and and white um, soldiers who wanted to write about their experiences. Mm -hmm. Wow. So before we end, I want to go back to um, the point that you emphasize about family. Um, you know, you quote someone that says, um, there's a large body of African Americans who um, are willing to um, enlist into the army. By the end of 1863, some 37,000 African Americans had enlisted in the U uh, Union Army in 58 segregated regiments known as the United States Colored Troops. And at the same time, you mentioned that the casualties of war included women and children that are left behind. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes. Um when um, the soldiers left um, in the South, um, they left um, the children um, who were also viewed as, as quote, helpless children, um, contraband, um, women who were pregnant, who lost children um, during um, their flight following um, the Union troops. But most of the families that that's, that died that we know of 
are part of the descriptions that we that I, I read and listened to in the WPA oral histories. Um, the memory that was, I guess, part of their loss that they shared had a lot to do with the children um, and what happened to their children, uh, what happened to their sisters or their brothers. And they just, they described them in their in these um, these experiences in the narratives. Uh, there was one woman that I I loved, um, and it was the story of a mother who had looked for uh, Garland White, a mother who had looked for her son for a number of years, who was sold into slavery, and um, she wrote to um she when when the uh, union troops i'm sorry i'm trying trying to remember all of the the many stories that i i wanted to to share mm-hmm. but when she when the union troops entered the city of richmond they um there was a woman an older woman who asked black union um, soldiers do you know where garland white do you know garland white and finally Someone pointed the woman, directed the woman to uh, Garland White, who was the chaplain of, of the uh, one of the troops, and she asked him a number of questions from "What is your name? What is your mother's name? Um, where were you sold from? What's your you know the different stories, um, the experience?" And she knew that he was in in. Georgia, that he moved to Canada, that he lived in Ohio. She asked a number of questions, and then she says at the end, this is your mother, Garland, who has searched for you for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And just to feel and imagine the there were 10 direct questions that she knew the answer to. And when I think about her story, that lost her son to someone who sold her, um, who who was purchased in in the Lower South, but there is a network of people who knew his whereabouts and from the entire time. And this is a woman who probably visited the city of uh, Richmond looking every day for her son. And, And that experience is another, when we think about the loss, not only of the death, but also the aspect of women whose children were sold into mm. into slavery. Mm. Mm. Wow, really remarkable and powerful. Just beautiful, just beautiful work that you produce, um, Professor Willis, the Black Civil War soldier. I want to know before we end: um, Are there any projects that you are working on now? It's a, it's really fascinating. A number of people have said to me that the Reflections in Black is out of print, which I was surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, that um, and, and asked, are you going to reprint that? Are we going to reprint it? I um, contacted the publisher to ask the question, <laughs> and yesterday they we had a, a long conversation about it, and so yes. We're going to reprint Reflections in Black and want to move it forward to the 21st century and to include um, photographers that I've encountered and others have encountered over um, um, the, for the past 20 years to open up that conversation. I'm also working on a project with the National Gallery of Art Um and, and the Black Arts Movement is, is an exhibition that's going to be in 2023, 24. Mm. And I'm also making my photographs. Mm. <laughs> so I'm interested in photographing in um, Philadelphia uh, families and photographing just recently in a show called Staying Power that's um, at the Village Philadelphia, Philly rather, that Monument Lab has organized. So I'm 
making my photographs and continuing to try to find a, a place to show them and, and excited about when I'm when curators are contacting me and, and the, the younger curators who are contacting me and <laughs> saying, <laughs> thank you, you know, your work is so important and we'd love to have you in an exhibition. And just like you reached out to me, I, I really, I'm indebted to your interest and your voice and your interest in exploring and addressing my work. Oh, Professor Willis, I'm indebted to you for really honing in and and keying in on African-American artists, photographers, as well as African-American women. They are essential. And as you said in the beginning, representing not only just a moment, but representing a people. So I'm just so glad that I have this opportunity. And I'm glad that you are still writing, that you are still um I'm photographing and that you are curating with your upcoming projects. It's just fantastic. And I can't wait to um, get the new edition of Reflections um, <laughs> in yeah, Black. 22. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then to see the, um, the exhibition, the Black Arts Movement, I'm fascinated by that. Part of my dissertation um, uh, focuses on uh, the Black Arts Movement. Um, and we can talk about that later. Um, Ooh, I'd like and... to know what, what's, what, what's the title of your dissertation. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm I'm still I'm still trying to figure it out. But my dissertation focuses on um, Black storytellers and storytellers mm -hmm. who um, tell folklore and fables and legends. And I'm periodizing it from the 1970s through. Um, the 1990s. And um, it's a Black storytelling movement. And um, they actually said the origins um, is from the Black arts movement. Mm. Um, and and so it's fascinating. I, I spent last summer um, speaking to um, a great collection of African-American storytellers um, that are still um, working today um, and began um, some of them began um, them. Some that began in the seventies are still alive um, today, um, but it's just remarkable, remarkable. So I want to talk more about um, your conceptualization of the Black Arts Movement um, mm -hmm. through this exhibition at some other time. Okay. But this is just fantastic. Professor Willis is the university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imogen at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. She is also the director of the NYU's Center for Black Visual Culture. And she is the author of the new book, The Black Civil War Soldier, A Visual History of Conflict and Citizenship, published by New York University Press. Professor Willis, I wanna thank you so much for being on the show and a fantastic conversation. Thank you.